السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Alright, so inshallah ta'ala, tonight, um, as you've already seen the message that was texted out to the community and also I posted on my Facebook, the topic for tonight's lecture is the issue of Valentine's Day. And uh, of course here it's the 10th of February, we're coming to a close. Uh, so if I remember correctly, the 14th is on Sunday, right? So this is something, we are nearing that day, uh, this is something that occurs comes back every year and by the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being in this community for uh, the past three years well coming here in 2018 this is basically the fourth Valentine's Day uh, I'm finding myself with you guys I actually didn't have the chance to in the previous years have the chance to talk about this subject so alhamdulillah this is a new topic for uh, myself delivering in this community so I thought inshallah ta'ala it would be beneficial to all of us because I did have a few brothers and sisters who asked me just last week if I could uh, give a lecture on this subject so that as Muslims it is clear for us if this is something that we should celebrate or stay away from and of course that is uh, the number one priority for any Muslim man or woman that as you grow in your Islam as you grow as a Muslim in your daily life, you learn, you acquire more knowledge, you have to be improving in your Islam, in your commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The older we get, with every day that passes, we get closer to our grave. We get closer to being questioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the eternal life which starts after death. This dunya life is a temporary life. So it's very important for us as Muslims, not being... That, it, that we don't just be content with whatever it is that we know. Every day a Muslim has to improve and increase in knowledge and ibadah and practice. And of course increase in tawbah, in seeking forgiveness. That's the Muslim who will inshallah ta'ala succeed after death. Not the Muslim who remains stagnant, who remains in, in one level. And he thinks he or she is in one level but the shaitan will keep dragging him backwards and backwards and backwards. So in order to fight the shaitan, every day you must learn something new about your religion and every day you must learn how to apply that in your life, improve as a Muslim. Alright, so having said this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are, this lecture will be, it's not going to be a bunch of ayat or a hadith, we're going to look at few verses and a few a hadith, but then we're going to look at the historical aspect of where Valentine's Day came from. As Muslims, it is important for us to grasp the concept. If we just came here and said, okay, Valentine's Day is a day of shirk or bid'ah or it's halal, whatever may be the case, and you just leave, you haven't really learned much. You need to learn the concept. You need to learn the historical aspect. You need to learn as to why something is, a day is okay to celebrate or a day is not okay to celebrate. You need to understand your religion correctly. And I keep repeating this over and over again, that we cannot be camel and sheep. Just because somebody says, go this way, like zombies, we just keep following them in a certain way. Muslims need to be Muslims of hikmah, of wisdom, of ilm, of knowledge and intellect. That Allah gave you a brain, Allah gave you heart. Use them, use your brain, use your heart to study your religion, to practice your religion based on ilm not just blindly following whatever is thrown in your direction. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Ma'idah, He has informed us, لِكُلِّنْ جَعَلْنَا مِنْكُمْ شِرْعَةً وَمِنْهَاجَةً To every one of you, meaning Bani Adam, to every group of people, we have prescribed a law. لِكُلِّنْ جَعَلْنَا مِنْكُمْ شِرْعَةً وَمِنْهَاجَةً We gave you a sharia, we gave you code of laws and وَمِنْهَاجَةً and a methodology. Every group of human beings that came from, Bani, from Adam alayhi salam till the day of judgment to every group of people from time to time through the prophets and messengers 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down to every group of people a certain sharia that they have to abide by, certain laws that they have to abide by, and waminhaja, and a methodology of understanding their religion, a methodology of understanding their book that was given to them by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah gave a law, and Allah also gave a methodology of understanding and practicing that law. In another place, for uh, like in Surah Hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, لِكُلِّ أُمَّةٍ جَعَلْنَا مَنَسَكًا مَنْ سَكَنْ مَنْ سَكَنْ هُمْ نَاسِكُوهُ To every ummah, لِكُلِّ أُمَّةٍ جَعَلْنَا مَنْ سَكَنْ هُمْ نَاسِكُوهُ To every ummah, to every nation, we gave religious ceremonies. مَنْ سَكَنْ هُمْ نَاسِكُوهُ We gave them religious ceremonies which they must follow. So these two verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, very clear. It's not, oh, what is he meaning here? What is this? It's very direct, very clear. To every group of people, we gave a sharia. Sharia meaning a law, a way of life. Wa minhaja, and a methodology of understanding that law and practicing that law. And in the second verse, Allah makes it clear. Likulli ummah, to every ummah, ja'alna man sakan hum nasiku. We gave religious ceremonies. We prescribed specific religious festivals which they must uh, follow. Right? So this is as a Muslim. If you said La ilaha illallah, you said Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah. Wa ashadu anna Muhammad rasulullah And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is the final prophet and messenger then this is something that you must understand. You must believe and accept. Allah gave us a sharia that's found in the Qur'an and the sunnah, the authentic sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Allah gave us a manhaj, a way of understanding. Remember, we keep, you probably heard me and many others say this, that we have to follow the manhaj of the salaf. We have to follow the manhaj, the understanding, the methodology, of the first three generations of Muslims, the Sahaba, the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Tabi'un, the Tabi Tabi'in, the second generation and the third generation, right? And this is of course from the Hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam from Bukhari and Muslim. In one Hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "Khairun nasi qarni, the best of the people is my generation. Thumma ladina yaluna hum, thumma ladina yaluna hum. Then the next, then the next. In the other narration." Khaira ummati qarni. The best of my ummah is my generation, meaning the companions. And then the next, then the next. So this is our evidence as to why we say you must practice Islam, understand Islam, approach Islam, study Islam based on the manhaj of the first three generations. Because Rasulullah sallallahu wasallam himself commanded us to do so. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that to every nation a sharia has been given and a manhaj has been given, for us as the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what is our sharia? Our sharia is the Qur'an and the authentic ahadith. That's where the sharia comes from, from the Qur'an and sunnah. And what is our manhaj? It's the way Abu Bakr, Umar, <coughs> Uthman, Ali, Fatima, Aisha, Khadija, Asma bint Abi Bakr, radiallahu anhum ajma'een. All of these men and women, these famous men and women, people of Jannah, people who are guaranteed paradise by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their way of understanding the meanings of the Qur'an, understanding the meanings of the hadith, that is our manhaj. So every nation has religious festivals that Allah has oblig obligated upon them, which they must practice. So keep these two verses in mind as we discuss this issue of Valentine's Day, and likewise, not just Valentine's Day, whether it be Mother's Day, Father's Day, Son Day, Daughter Day, I don't know if there's days for that, I'm just <laughs> saying it, right? Independence Day, Christmas Day, whatever day that you see in the Western cultures, Indian cultures, Buddhist cultures, meaning non-Muslim cultures, religions and cultures, whatever day that they have, the concept of Islam is the same. It's not that, well, this is Valentine's Day lecture, so this lecture is only applicable to Valentine's Day. Mother's Day, Father's Day, uh, Christmas Day, this day and that day is different. 
The concept is exactly the same. Every nation has their own sharia, has their manhaj. Every ummah has their specific mandatory religious festivities that they must follow. These two verses are applied across the board when it comes to any type of day. So inshallah ta'ala with this, let's get into the topic. So we're saying we're talking about Valentine's Day. What is the origin of Valentine's Day? In order to understand any matter, you must go back to the origin. Like let's say we talk to the non-Muslims or you might, as Muslims you get angry. Somebody comes on TV, somebody comes on CNN, BBC, Fox News especially. All Muslims are terrorists, Islam is a terroristic religion. It really angers you, it upsets you. And you are saying, what do you reply to such non-Muslims? Listen, don't look at the Muslims, look at the origin of the religion which is the Qur'an, the text of the holy book, the text of the hadith. So even when it comes to our own religion, when non-Muslims criticize the behavior of Muslims, we tell them, go back and look at the origin of the religion, which is the Qur'an and hadith. Judge our religion by the original texts, not what the Muslims are doing. Don't judge me based on what I'm doing. I'm a sinner. I make mistakes. Today I'm doing good deeds. Tomorrow I do bad deeds. Day after tomorrow, I come back. Don't look at me. You judge Islam by looking at the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the words, the actions, the behavior of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So likewise, anything, any cultural festivity, any cultural behavior, any cultural any custom of any group of people, we go back and we look at the origin of where it came from. Then we get the full picture of what this day really is. So what is the origin of Valentine's Day? As we know, it occurs every year on the 14th of February. And across the United States, in Europe, in Australia, New Zealand, meaning all these Western lands. This is where uh, they used to be, it used to be celebrated. And then over time, in, the, in recent decades, it also reached countries of Asia, in uh, countries, uh, you know, African countries, uh, Middle East, well, Middle East is in Asia, but you, you get the point. Uh, these other, what we would say, Eastern countries, non-European countries. But before, for centuries, it was only practiced by the Europeans, the European Christians, Jews, uh, and, and whatever other religions the Europeans may have been. It's only been in recent decades that Eastern cultures the non-Christian, non-Jewish societies have adopted to this uh, custom. And all these other days as well, Mother's Day, Father's Day, right? Even if you are watching, you're originally from Bangladesh or Pakistan or some Arab country or African country, ask yourself this. When you were a child, maybe you're now 50, 60 years old, 40 years old. When you were a kid, do you remember your parents celebrating Mother's Day or Father's Day or Valentine's Day? The answer I am almost 100% sure is no. It has literally reached your countries during your lifetime. Muslims before did not do this. In my parents' generation when, when we were young, no, Muslim countries did not celebrate Valentine's Day or Mother's Day or Father's Day or any of these days. It's literally just the past couple of decades that it has boomed, two or three decades that has boomed. It spread like wildfire across uh, the globe. But before, in European cultures, for centuries, this was present. So Valentine's Day, the, according to some of the Europeans, it, it stems for, or, or it comes from, especially people of the Christian background, the Catholic background specifically, they say that this is a day dedicated to Saint Valentine. And the, this is a, a speculation. There's not really an authentic uh, interpretation or explanation for this. This is just an assumption. The more authentic historical rec recorded historical event is that this was an ancient Roman ritual, Lupercalia, when we'll discuss this, that is what uh, Valentine's Day is. So some, there's some information that it stemmed from these Catholics, St. Valentine's Day, but this is just speculation. There's not really any solid evidence to support the Catholics uh, suggestion that it came from their saint. 
uh, saint in, in our Muslim terms we say you find the Sufis worshipping awliya that this is wali fulan, you go to the grave of so and so, miracles will happen to you. The concept of wilaya, this wali, this is what in English is saintism, right? So this is of course shirk. So Catholics are really dependent on saint worship. Uh, this is it's, it's one of their it's what their aqidah of Catholicism is to depend on saint worship. So we're going to look at both of them. So let's look at the minority opinion, the opinion that is not really that solid. That Catholics will claim that this is a day dedicated to Saint Valentine. Saint Valentine. So what is this his history of Valentine's Day or Saint Valentine's Day? Even in the Catholic history, there's about a dozen Valentines, by the way. <laughs> a dozen Valentines. And then predominantly two or three of them really famous Saint Valentines. So there's ikhtilaf among the Catholics as to which St. Valentine this day is dedicated to. So they themselves are not really sure. So the Catholic Church, uh, they recognize at least three different saints named Valentine or Valentinus, all of whom were martyred. So they, were, they attained shuhada according to Catholicism. So they have three major St. Valentines who died for their religion, their Catholic religion. So one legend, it says that Valentine was a priest who served during the third uh, century in Rome. That's one of the legends of Catholicism. When Emperor Claudius II decided that single men are better to join the army than married men, because married men, they go to fight, they're going to think of their wife. And if they're fathers, they're going to think of their children. No need for this. Let's take the single men and put them in the army. And this Claudius, Emperor Claudius II, he had banned young men from getting married because he wanted the young men to join the army. So they're fully focused in, in uh, you know, raising the Roman Empire and this and that. Right? This is all what you're focused on, war. Don't think of family and children and things like that. So Valentine, he realized that this is injustice. Young men want to, they have desires, they have the feeling of wanting to be loved, they want to get married, they want to love a woman and be loved and returned by a woman. So what did this Valentine do? In secret, he defied this uh, law of Claudius II, and he continued, because he's a priest, he continued to do marriages in secret. He got men and women get married in secret. So once Claudius II found out, he executed Valentine. So he became a shaheed for Catholics, right? The, uh, so others say, uh, within the Catholic Church, they say that this is uh, this day, Valentine's Day, this is not that Valentine who was secretly getting people married uh, because of this issue, but this is another Saint Valentine of Terni. He was a bishop, not a priest, uh, a bishop, who was the true namesake of this holiday, and he also was beheaded by the same Claudius II uh, outside of Rome for similar, uh, similar situation, similar reasons. Other stories within uh, the Catholic Church, they suggest that Valentine may have been killed for attempting to help Christians escape the harsh Roman conditions, the harsh Roman prison, prisons. So he would go secretly break out the Christians who are being imprisoned by the Roman Empire, and he would go and save them. While he's doing this, this Valentine, he fell in love with the jailer's daughter. Sounds like a Bollywood movie, right? And maybe they were singing and dancing uh, too. <laughs> so this is the other legend, that this Valentine went, he's saving the Christians in secret, making them escape from the prisons, and as he's doing this, he met the jailer's daughter, fell in love, and one thing led to the other. And, of course, he then got caught and got executed for this. So, before his death, he actually allegedly, allegedly, no solid evidence, allegedly wrote a letter, a love letter, to the jailer's daughter from your valentine. This is where the whole notion that you see people, you know, will you be my valentine? Will you be my valentine? This is where it came from. So allegedly this person wrote the letter that from your Valentine, such and such. Now again, these 
Catholic Church versions are very murky. There's no solid historical fact. This, uh, as later Christian scholars have said, this is probably the church's way of Christianizing the holiday. Because the funny thing about Christians, just as Allah says, Allah said that uh, Allah called the Jews al maghdub that غير المغضوب ولا الضالين, right? The maghdub are the Yahud. And this is a tafsir from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He's the one who interpreted this verse from Surah Fatiha this way. So don't think, oh, this sounds so harsh. This is from the mouth of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, al maghdub these are the Yahud. Dalun, these are the Nasara, the Christians. Because they have no idea where their religion came from. They can, none of them can agree to what their aqidah is, what their books are, who are these people. So there's always ikhtilaf among the Christians as to what their beliefs are. Right? So the same thing, this is another example. They'll say Valentine's Day is named after this priest, St. Valentine. The other Christian says, no, no, it's because the bishop. The other Christian will say, no, it's the guy who fell in love with the jailer's daughter and was freeing the Christians from prison. There's ikhtilaf. They themselves don't know what exactly or which saint this came from. All right, so this is the Christian or the Catholic version. Again, as I said, this is assumptions. There's no solid evidence, but the Catholic Church likes to preach these three different variations. Now let's go to the orig original version or the real version that has historical records. It's been recorded in history, which is it was a Roman pagan festival. So while the Christians, some Christians, they believe that Valentine's Day is celebrated in the middle of February to commemorate the anniversary of St. Valentine, and only Allah knows which one of the three St. Valentines, that because one of, it's attributed to their death, it's, a, it's an anniversary to his death, man of love, and uh, getting people married, and falling in love with him by himself, with some lady, right, or some girl. Uh, so, and this happened around the year 270. We are now in the Christian calendar, Gregorian calendar, 2021. So according to the Gregorian calendar, this incident happened somewhere around 270. And, uh, but the, as I said, this was an attempt by the Catholic Church to Christianize the Roman pagan celebration of Lupercalia. So what is Lupercalia? It was celebrated in the middle of the month of February. Now, if you look at the Roman calendar, for those of you who've gone to college, maybe you've done world history or art history and things like that. I'm sure you know that they teach you about Greek culture, Roman Empire, uh, the Byzantine Empire, same thing. Uh, you know, uh, you, you learn these in art history or world history and things like that. So, uh, according to the Roman calendar, uh, the the Ides of a month would be 13th or 15th, depending on which month you're uh, judging in the Roman calendar. So this one, Lupercalia, would be in the Ides of February, meaning the 13th or the 14th or the 15th. One of these three days. This is where they would celebrate this Lupercalia. <coughs> what was Lupercalia? It was a fertility festival dedicated to Faunus, Faunus was the Roman god of agriculture, an ilah of the Roman Empire, of the Roman religion. Faunus was an ilah of agriculture, a god of agriculture. And as well as this has something to do with the founders of Rome, Romulus and Remus. I had given a khutbah on the 1st of January in our community. It's on, you, on my YouTube channel about the Islamic calendar versus the Gregorian calendar. And in that khutbah, I had mentioned uh, to the community briefly about this person, Romulus, the founder of Rome, because he had a hand in the Roman calendar. He is the founder of Rome. So same thing here. Uh, so now what is this Lupercalia? Let's get into the issue of the Roman paganism. So the founders of Rome, Romulus and Remus. And it was dedicated to Faunus, the Roman god of agriculture. All right. So to begin this festival, what did the Roman pagans do? They had the members of the Lupercai. Lupercai were special priests of the Roman uh, order. So they're the Roman priests. They would gather in a secret cave, a sacred cave. This is their holy cave. So the priests of the Lupercai, they will gather in the cave. 
uh, where the infants Romulus and Remus were. These are the founders of Rome. So when they were born, the, they're t still infants, Romulus and Remus. So they, it is believed, Roman legend says <laughs> that these two were cared for, and I'm not making this up, this is the Roman history. Right? These two were cared for and milked and they sucked and they drank milk from a from she-wolf, from a she-wolf. So, you know, when the first time I read this, I was like, oh, this is where Mowgli from the Jungle Book probably came from. <laughs> Raised by wolves. Poor Indian guy, kid, lost his parents, grew up in the jungles of India, and was raised by wolves. So anyways, this is what the Romans believe, that Romulus and Remus, their founders, they were cared for and nurtured and given milk by a she-wolf. So they grew up uh, drinking the milk of a she-wolf. So the priests, they would, uh, on this day of Lupercalia, they would slaughter two animals, a goat and a dog. And both of these animals would have a different uh, significance. The priests, they satis uh, sacrificed the goat for fertility and the dog for purification. The goat for fertility and the dog for purification. That's not all. It gets sicker. So they would sacrifice the goat, they would sacrifice the dog, uh, take the, the skin of the goat and the dog, bloody skin, and then they will go and parade through the streets of Rome and all the young men, and especially the women, they will, you know, uh, present themselves in the streets of Rome. They will take the goat skin and they will slap it as the priests are, you know, parading through the streets. And they would smack the single women with the bloody uh, goat skin. Why? Because the Roman superstition was, if a woman was lucky enough to be smacked by this bloody goat skin, she is going to become fertile. She is going to deliver babies within the next year, before the next Lupercalia festival, right? So the, they would be smacked by this goat skin, the blood of the goat, and this would, be, would make these women fertile. And the dog, of course, being smacked by the dog skin, the bloody dog skin, would be purifying these women and men. So far from being fearful, you would see that this is, was a sickening. I mean, can you imagine... Here are a bunch of ladies of all the city, single women, just throwing themselves, happily dancing and being slapped by bloody goat skin and dog skin. I mean, who in their right mind would think of such things? Devilish pagans. People who worship the shaitan will do stuff like this. This is insane. Right? So, but anyways, this is what the Roman religion was. So they would welcome this. They would feel lucky that I got smacked by the goat skin or the dog skin and so on and so forth. So later in that day, still we're talking about the Lupercalia festival. Later on that day, all the young women in the city, they would place their names. Those who got smacked, they have the blood marks, the goat blood and the dog blood, blood on them. They would throw their names in a big urn. And all the Roman bachelors would come and pick the name out to do what? To commit zina, to have, fulfill their wildest sexual desires. This is satanism. I mean, this is purely satanic. No person in their right mind, I mean, this is filthy. What type of religious festival is this? But this is what they would do. They would dedicate this day to their god of agriculture and fertility. So the single, the bachelors of Rome would come and pick out the name. Aha, I found this name. You, you're mine. Some of them would lead to marriage. But most of them were just, you know, having, I'm sorry to use this word, just having orgies with one another. This was their filthy uh, culture and their religion. That is the origin of Valentine's Day. It came from Roman paganism. The whole celebration is about Worshipping shaitan, worshipping an ilah, sacrificing animals for an ilah other than Allah. It's about these filthy rituals of having blood, animal blood being rubbed on you and then leading to zina. Sometimes they would get married. So this is what it was. You know, so illicit sexual activities, shirk of the worst kind and all these other filthy behavior. 
So that is the origin of where Valentine's Day came from. This festival, Roman festival of Lupercalia, that they would celebrate from, from the 13th to the 15th. It was a two or three day festival. So Valentine's, now let's fast forward. We know that the Ro Rome eventually came under Christian rule. And when the Christians took over Rome, Christians are, I mean, they have a, PA, a, a plus. They get A plus in committing bid'ah. Their whole religion is about bid'ah. When, whenever the Christians went somewhere, whatever cultural things that nation was doing, they would Christianize it. I'll give you another example. In the Roman Empire, they would have animals dedicated to every god that they had. So the Christians, they thought, wait a minute, Jesus should have an animal symbol too, so it will become easier for the Romans to accept our religion because it's very similar. So they were thinking and thinking and thinking. Again, this is historical, there's, it's recorded in history. I'm not making this up. So search, read through history, read through Christian history, and you'll find this. So they thought the fish, the fish benefits people whether it's alive or dead. Jesus, he died for our sins. He benefited people while he was alive and he's going to benefit people after his death. So fish became the symbol of Jesus. I'm sure living in America, you have seen many bumper stickers. There's a fish and inside the fish is Jesus. And you see the Christians, many cars have that on their bumper. So now you know where the Christians got that from. It's a bid'ah. It has nothing to do with Isa alayhi salam, has nothing to do with the ori original message that Allah gave to Isa alayhi salam. But the Christians, they introduced this bid'ah to somewhat mix Christianism and Romanism to make it easier for the pagans to adopt to Christianity. One of my shuyukh, one of, uh, he's from Sudan, so he was, uh, when I was studying with him, he was telling us that, you know, in some parts of Africa, certain tribes are naked. They're still naked in Africa. So these Christian missionaries, they go. They say, oh, you want to be naked? No problem. Jesus still loves you. They built a church, and the priest is a naked priest. That's Christianity. Dalun. They have no aqidah whatsoever. They will give up their aqidah just for the numbers. And many Muslims are exactly like this, subhanAllah. They don't have any ghira for the aqidah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah sent down. What is it that we need to trim from our religion? Sure, sure, you, you'll like me better, you will be gain in popularity. Trim from here, trim from there. They introduce bid'ah and, and then you see nothing is left of Islam. So there are people like that even within our ummah. So anyways, these Christians, this is what they did. They somewhat Christianized this day. That okay, the Romans are already celebrating Lupercalia. Why don't we just take this day, keep this celebration, make it a romantic day of love and this and that. We'll just say that this is for St. Valentine. This is what we'll do. So this is how the Christians got into this. And during the Middle Ages, the Middle Ages of European history is... Uh, also known as the Dark Ages, the medieval period. This is when, uh, uh, what was it, subhanAllah? Before it was, I, which king was it? I completely forgot, lost my train of thought. Uh, this is before the Renaissance period started. And it was a period between the death of uh, somebody and before the Renaissance period started uh, in Europe. This was known as the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages or the medieval period. Uh, as I'm giving, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll remember, inshallah, uh, uh, through the lecture. Uh, <clears throat> so anyways, during the Middle Ages, this became very popular. Uh, the European Christians, especially in England and France, not the other parts of Europe, especially England and France, it became very popular. They were celebrating this uh, 15, uh, 14th of February, this Valentine's Day, uh, and this is what was happening. Uh, even in uh, history, it's mentioned that there was an English poet uh, uh, Jeffrey Chaucer and it was I think uh, I have it recorded somewhere yeah Jeffrey Chaucer in, in a poem in 13, uh, 1375 he wrote a poem uh, called the Parliament of Fowls that was the first time where uh, really these concept of greeting cards was introduced in the European Christian culture and there, in, one, in, in this poem the Parliament of Fowls he has a verse in that poem 
uh, for this was sent on St. Valentine's Day, when every fowl cometh there to choose his mate. So what they would do was, they would say that this is uh, the time where the birds are mating, right? So, okay, birds are mating. We Human beings can also take this uh, time to share their love for one another. So this is what they do. They play games with the pagan festivities. They want to Christianize it by keeping those attributes of paganism, and then they have a mixed fruit basket of shirk and bid'ah of all kinds. So Valentine greetings were popular uh, during these uh, Middle Ages. And also, uh, Valentine's, it, uh, the writings did not become really that popular until after uh, 1400, the year 1400. And there was another poem in English history around in 1415 by Charles. He was the Duke of Orleans uh, while his wife was imprisoned. Uh, while he was imprisoned, sorry, in the Tower of London, he was writing love letters or poems to his wife. And then uh, the concept of greeting cards and things like that slowly but surely over time really uh, found popularity among the people. So these are all, as I said, just go through uh, your history. Uh, these manuscripts are to this day are collected in the British Library in London. So these are historically recorded of how this day or where this day came from. Right? So this is known. It's not that sheikhs and imams just decided to make this up. We got this information from their history, from their books. That's where we found it from because obviously this is alien to Islam, has nothing to, no significance whatsoever to Islam. All right, now the next thing is, so we talked about the Christian significance on this day, and the root is Roman pagan festival of Lupercalia. Now the next and the last question is, where did the naked baby with the wings come from, with the bow and arrow, the Cupid? Right, where did this person come from? The Cupid, we see that uh, he is often portrayed on Valentine's Day cards, uh, decorations and things like this, right? You see that naked white baby uh, with the bow and arrow. He's shooting his arrows and randomly shooting his arrows. If you've been chosen by Cupid and he shoots an arrow at you and he shoots another arrow at some lady, you two are going to fall in love, right? This is what they say. Uh, Cupid goes back to uh, a Roman god, and but his roots go back to Greek mythology. He was the Greek god of love, Eros. So in Greek, religion, ancient Greek religion, ancient Roman religion. This was the god, Ilah, of love, Eros. And according to some of the Greek uh, poets, Eros was a handsome immortal played by emo who used to play with the emotions of God and men, using golden arrows to incite love. I mean, a'udhu billah, this is shirk of the worst kind. So, we say to the Muslims today that you're f buying these Valentine's Day cards. So you see the root is Roman paganism. This Cupid is an ilah of Greek religion and Roman religion, an ilah of love. And as a Muslim, the one who says, La ilaha illallah, you think this is okay to celebrate? When even the pictures of Aliha are on these cards, pictures of Aliha belonging to the Greek religions and Roman religions to this day are everywhere on this day. It should strike you as a person of Tawheed that this is not for me. This is a day of shirk. Not, I mean, not just haram and this and that. No, it is a day of shirk. It came from shirk. People were worshipping the devil, doing devilish things. And it just stemmed. It went from Roman pagans to the Christians, then the Jews, then it passed down to the Muslims. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu, he said in the hadith that's collected in Bukhari and Muslim, in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, لَتَتْبَعُنَّ سَنَنَا مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ شِبْرًا شِبْرًا وَذِرَاعًا بِذِرَاعٍ You will certainly follow the ways of the nations before you, span by span, cubit by cubit, meaning footstep by footstep, inch by inch. حَتَّى لَوْ دَخَلُوا جُحْرَ دَبِّنْ even if they were to walk into a lizard hole, you will for sure follow them. So we asked, Ya Rasulullah, O Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al Yahudu wa Nasara, 
are you referring to the Jews and Christians? That we are going to be copycats of the Jews and Christians. Everything that they do, every wrong thing that they do, we are going to follow the Jews and the Christians, footstep by footstep, inch by inch, to the point that if they were to walk into a lizard hole, even though we can't fit into the lizard hole, we're going to forcefully go inside. Qala, the Prophet ﷺ replied, Faman, who else am I talking about? So yeah, you're going to follow the Jews and the Christians inch by inch in every wrong thing that they did, you will also do it. Meaning some people from this ummah or many people from this ummah. In the other narration of Sahih al-Bukhari, actually one hadith before it, uh, from Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, لا تقوم الساعة حتى تأخذ أمتي بأخذ القرون قبلها شبراً بشبراً وذراعاً بذراعاً The hour will not be established until my followers, they copy, they imitate the actions of the people who came before them, inch by inch, span by span, footstep by footstep. فَقِيلَ And it was asked, Ya Rasulullah, Kafarisa wa Rum, are you referring to the Persians and the Romans? Qala, the Prophet ﷺ replied, Waman in Nasu illa ulaik. That who else from mankind am I talking about except them? So we have two hadiths in Bukhari and Muslim, the second one in Bukhari. So the Prophet ﷺ is talking about the Jews, the Christians, the Persian pagans, the Roman pagans, meaning any pagan cultures and religions, the Jewish culture religions, the Christian culture religions. Don't think that the hadith is, oh, I, I can't follow Jews and Christians, but it's okay, I can follow the Buddhists and Hindus because I'm from the subcontinent. You, it's about everybody, any non-Muslim, any mushrik, any kafir, that you will follow these mushrikun that came before you. You're going to do all the evil deeds that they did, inch by inch, footstep by footstep. This is a warning from the Prophet ﷺ. This is a criticism. So, and what the Prophet ﷺ said back then, right, over a thousand years ago, he prophesied. Do we not see, subhanAllah, his prophecy, وسلم, coming true in, as we speak? So many Muslims across this world doing bid'ah. They behave just like the Jews. They speak just like the Jews. They worship just like the Jews. They do things, violate Allah's Sharia, just like the Christians. They introduce shirk, just like the Christians. They do the things that the Persian pagans used to do. They do the things that the Roman pagans used to do. Exactly what the Prophet ﷺ said would happen, is happening right before our eyes. So we need to educate ourselves about the sunnah of Rasulullah ﷺ, about tawheed, that what things constitute shirk, and what things constitute are part of Tawheed? What things are part of the Sunnah and what things contradict the Sunnah, meaning our bid'ah? We have to learn about this in order to protect ourselves, our, protect our Muslim identity, and of course protect ourselves bi'idnillah from the blazing Jahannam after death. And we see that th this has become more uh, disastrous after the, uh, this uh, internet sensation. Before, back in the day, we grew up with TV and radio, right? Now you have internet. I mean, and now you got the smartphones, which is making us dumber and dumber every day. The shirk, the kufr, the haram, the filthy, it's right in the palm of your hands. So if you are not guarding your religion, you are going to be destroyed. You're going to turn into the devil's playground, right? Look what's going on. Uh, we might say, uh, and, I, and I'm speaking in the context of our area, you don't have to go to the casinos to gamble anymore. You can gamble with your smart smartphone. You can download the casino apps and download other gambling apps and start gambling uh, right at your home, in your house, on your phone. You don't even have to visit the casinos anymore. This is how easy it has become to do haram. This is how easy it has become to fall into shirk, to fall into bid'ah, to fall into haram. So if we don't safeguard our religion, if we don't remind ourselves of tawheed, if we don't remind ourselves of the sunnah, the adab of Islam, the behavior of Islam, the speech of Islam, the actions of Islam, 
we're going to lose ourselves. And many of us have lost ourselves. Many of us have lost their children. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, he said in the hadith that's collected in Abu Dawood, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man tashabbaha bi qawmin fahuwa minhum. Whoever imitates a group of people is from them. This hadith is a good news as well as a warning. If you imitate Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali, if the sisters imitate Aisha and Khadija and Fatima, if you imitate anyone, it means you are from them, inshallah ta'ala. So if you imitate the good people, inshallah ta'ala, you will be with them in Jannah. But if you imitate the bad people, guess what? And we seek refuge in Allah. You are going to wake up with them and be with them in Jahannam. مَنْ تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمٍ فَهُوَ مِنْهُمْ Whoever you imitate, you are with them. So this is a good news as well as a warning, depending on what you actually do, who you're actually imitating. And we see our sons and daughters. They don't want to do the Islamic etiquettes. Like we see, subhanAllah, and I, it, it breaks my heart. You come to the Masajid of Allah, you're going to see uh, our young brothers, right? The, our young brothers, they'll have a hair on the top, completely shaved, as if they took a bowl and they shaved whatever underneath is the bowl and they keep the hair. Where did you get this haram hairstyle from? From the kuffar. Maybe his favorite athlete, uh, kafir athlete does this. Or he's going to have a mohawk in the middle. I mean, what's wrong with you? What happened to your Islam? Don't you feel proud of being a Muslim? Because this is an identity crisis. The Muslim youth does not know what his religion is. He has nothing to be proud of. So he starts imitating the Jew and the Christian and the Hindu and the atheist and whatnot. Because he doesn't know what he is. Right? And at the end of the day, they're still going to call you, Oh, Muhammad, you're a terrorist. Your family's a terrorist. You're this, you're that. Hey, Bin Laden's nephew. You will still be called names. Even though you're trying to change your attire to just look like them. It's not going to work. You can't change your facial attributes nor your name. You can't. Be proud of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. Be proud of your Islam. Learn about your Islam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in another hadith uh, from our mother Aisha radiallahu anha. This is from uh, collected in Bukhari and Muslim. When during the day of Eid, and our mother, she forgot if it was the day of Eid al-Fitr or Eid al-Adha. But in one of the days, one of the two days, there were some two, couple of young girls from the Ansar. They were singing some nasheed uh, and, and they were beating the duff, right? So Abu Bakr, he walked in, in his house or the house of Aisha radiallahu anha. And he said, Mazamiru shaytan Amazamiru shaytan fi bayti Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa The instruments of shaytan by default, and I, I gave a lecture in our community a couple of years back. We went through all the evidences of music and why music, musical instruments is haram. So by default, Abu Bakr knew musical instruments is uh, satanic tools. So he's saying the moment he walked in, into his daughter's house, Amazamiru shaytan, the, the sound, the instruments of shaytan, fi bayti rasulillah, in the house of Allah's messenger, what are you doing, ya Aisha? So the Prophet ﷺ heard, and he said, da'huma ya Abu Bakr, leave them, O Abu Bakr, inna li kulli qawmin eidan, every group of people has eid, wa inna eidana hadha al-yawm, and this is our day of eid, and this is the evidence, that women are allowed to beat the duff on the day of Eid. And of course, we have other ahadith on the day of a wedding. Only women, not men. Right? Women among themselves can beat the duff. That's the only halal musical instrument. They can sing among themselves with good words on the day of Eid and on the day at a walima, at a wedding. Only women by themselves. Right? So the Prophet ﷺ clearly told Abu Bakr and by telling him, told the entire ummah. Every nation has their festivities. Eid, what is the word Eid in the Arabi language? Now we're going to get into the linguistic meaning. Eid in the, in the language, it means a recurring day of festivities. 
Every year that day comes back where people gather, they have special food, they have special things that they do for that day, commemorating that day. They gather together every single year. That is what the definition of the word Eid means. Isn't Valentine's Day a day of Eid? Every single year, February 14th, people gather. They have special foods, special decorations. The chocolates and the heart-shaped this and this and that, the red uh, clothing and this, all sorts of things, right? Special festivities. Nobody goes and gives the heart-shaped chocolate on Halloween, <laughs> right? Because Halloween has its own specific gatherings and festivities. Mother's Day has their, its own special rituals. Father's Day has its own spe special rituals and gatherings. So any day that is recurring, every year the day comes back in which the people gather and they perform special deeds, they prepare special foods, that is Eid in the language. And the Prophet ﷺ said clearly, إِنَّ لِكُلِّ قَوْمٍ عِيدًا وَإِنَّ عِيدَنَا هَذَا الْيَوْمِ Every group of people have their Eid. But our Eid is this. Clear cut. As a Muslim, you have no days of celebration, recurring days of celebration, except for Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. Now, of course, some wise guy or wise woman is going to say, Oh, Islam is so boring. Islam is so boring. I want to leave Islam. For what? Because you can't celebrate Valentine's Day? That's your conclusion? Subhanallah. That's how shallow your mind is? What about Friday being a day of Eid? Which is from the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa How many Fridays do you have in a year? 50 to 52 Fridays? Aren't you happy that Allah has given you 50 or 52 days of Eid in a year? Plus the day of Fitr. Plus the days of Adha. Are you not happy that you have close to 60 days of Eid in a year? But the shaitan will come to you. Oh my God, I can't celebrate Valentine's Day. That's it. I hate Islam. I'm leaving. This is what happens to our youth. Fools. Deceived by the shaitan. Because they don't understand their religion. Father's Day, Mother's Day, Valentine's Day, Christmas Day, Halloween. What else can we add? Independence Day, Thanksgiving Day. Seven days. I literally counted seven days. And that's the end of your life because you cannot celebrate seven days of the year according to the American culture. But Allah has given you close to 60 days of Eid. This is what happens when people are deceived by the shaitan and they are fooled and they don't know their religion. Same thing. You ask a young person, I can't have, I can't go clubbing and drink alcohol. Subhanallah, it's the end of life. You can't do two things. Go gra grab your friends, go play a game of basketball. Go for a drive, go eat somewhere, go have some halal food. Go. There's a thousand kinds of juices that you can drink, but you're upset that you can't drink beer. That's the end of the world for you. You need to leave Islam because of this. This is how shaitan deceives our children. You sound like a fool if this is your argument against Islam. And you need to remind them. Don't think that this is harsh. They, many young brothers and sisters, subhanAllah, I've met, Imam, I don't like my religion. Ah, my parents are too strict. What happened, brother? What happened? I, I like this girl. I can't go out on a date. Oh, you really like the girl? Yeah, I do. I can't live without her. Okay, let's get you married and you make her your wife and you're responsible over her. No, 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 no. That's too much for me. Then what type of love do you have that you don't want to care for a woman? You just want to fulfill your desires and pack your bags and say, Ma, ma salama? So this is fake. You need to corner your children just like this. When your son comes to you and says, I, want, I, I need to have a girlfriend. Son, you know what? Go find whatever girl you want. I will do your marriage tomorrow. And you are responsible. Get a job and feed your wife just like I feed your mother. Watch him run. This 18-year-old will forget the idea of a woman. So you want to just fulfill your desires, but you don't want to love that woman and take care of her? So what do you think a woman is? A piece of meat? And then they will say, Islam is very... Uh, it, you know, it undermines the woman. But then our children grow up in this culture, they want to be treated like fleshes of meat, our young sisters, because they're deceived. Do you not see the honor of Islam? That if a man wants you, he has to marry you, he has to come to your family, 
he has to love you and take care of you and provide for you, then he can have you. Don't be so cheap that you just jump on his lap without any marriage, without any com commitment, and then he uses you and he leaves after a few days. That's what the West gives you. Islam gives you honor. Islam gives you dignity. So this lecture, of course, is for Valentine's Day. But you can apply the concept to every day that we see across the board. And it's just a few, a dozen days in the uh, Western culture that we don't celebrate. It's part, it's part of their customs and cultures. We're Muslim, we're people of Tawheed. Inshallah Ta'ala, we're people of Sunnah. That this shouldn't be the end of, that's it. I draw the line here. Either I can buy chocolates for my girlfriend or that's it. I, I'm angry with Allah. Why are you angry with Allah? When this day came from slaughtering dogs and goats and dedicating it to some god of the Roman uh, pagans. It has nothing to do with Allah. Allah has honored you. Right? And then, of course, we'll find Muslim couples. Uh, you know, once I did a counseling session, one, the sister was literally complaining. You know, brother, my husband, he, he doesn't care about my feelings. So I thought maybe this is about some negligence and things like that. So we're talking, talking, talking. She's literally complaining, he doesn't buy me anything on Valentine's Day. I said, subhanAllah. I said, brother, why don't you buy anything on Valentine's Day? He says, Sheikh, I used to buy her something on Valentine's Day because this is what we grew up. We got married, okay. But then I found out it's haram, so I stopped. She doesn't see the other hundreds of gifts that I give throughout the year. It has to be that day. It's the end of the world if you don't give a gift on that special day. But you don't see the other 300 odd days of the year. Look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He was a poor man, had nine wives at once, at one time. He would go out, even if it was something simple like half a date, he would bring it back for his wife. Did he wait for a special day? No, he didn't. If you have a husband who follows the sunnah, if he goes to the, let's say, giving a hypothetical example. He goes to a store, stops by, he's hungry, you know, you got to get yourself a Snickers when you're hungry. That's what they say. <laughs> it's, it's, mashallah, works for diabetic people like me. Uh, so you get hungry, before you become hangry, you buy yourself a Snickers bar. As you're buying a Snickers bar, think of your wife, buy her a piece of candy too, and you come home. It might be 50 cents, it might be 75 cents. It, the money is not the issue. It's the thought. So you ate some sweets and you bring some sweets for your wife. Do this. If you do it according to the sunnah on a regular basis, she won't care what Valentine's Day or this, that day, whatever it is. Like subhanAllah, you look at this culture. I, in my college days, in my secular education, uh, when I went to Texas for my university, they'd be joking around. And sometimes, oh man, I had such a horrible day yesterday. It's like, what happened? I had three different dates in three different locations. This is what he's doing, whichever one he can commit zina with. So he'll take three Valentine's Day dates, take them out to dinner, and whichever one he can commit zina with, he'll consider himself lucky for the night. That, that's, this is what they are. Or somebody will beat his wife throughout the year, then all of a sudden on Valentine's Day, here's a Hershey's Kisses for you, and she's, oh, my husband loves me so much. No, he does not love you. He abuses you throughout the entire year. This day does not mean anything. A man and a woman should love each other throughout the year, according to Islam. A man and woman should honor each other throughout the year, according to Islam. Not just this one day which stem, which came from shirk. Right? So don't be deceived, brothers and sisters. Open your eyes, open your ears, and most importantly, open your hearts to the message of Islam. Before we go to the Q&A, one other hadith from Abu Dawood, uh, from Anas radiallahu anhu. He said, قَدِمَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ الْمَدِينَةِ وَلَهُمْ يَوْمَانِ يَلْعَبُونَ فِيهِمَا When the Prophet وسلم, came to Medina after the migration, he found the people of Medina, they were celebrating two days in which they would gather, they would play. It's a, two days of festivities. فَقَالَ So he وسلم, coming from Mecca, he doesn't know the customs of Medina. So he asked them, ما هذان اليومان What are these two days that you have taken for play and festivals and so on and so forth? قالوا, they replied كُنَّا نَلْعَبُ فِيهِمَا فِي الْجَاهِلِيَةِ These two days, 
We used to play, we used to gather, we used to celebrate these two days in Jahiliya before becoming Muslim. فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم, إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ أَبْدَلَكُمْ بِهِمَا خَيْرًا مِنْهُمَا Indeed, Allah has exchanged, has changed these two days of yours for better. يَوْمُ الْأَدْحَ وَيَوْمُ الْفِطْرِ Those two aids. Give this up. That's Islam. When you become Muslim, you give away the customs of paganism, the customs that are anti-Islamic, the customs that contradict the religion of Islam. Clear cut. This is not something, and people will do it. There are so many celebrations in different cultures, right? Um, uh, like, for example, let's say, since I, 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 you know, my family is Bengali, I'll use my people first. Uh, like they have the Bengali New Year. I don't remember what it is, but this is something I remember people doing. They wear a specific color of sari, a specific this and a specific that. It is purely from Hinduism. It has nothing to do with Islam. Isn't it a day of Eid? Recurring day of Eid. Every single year you take this. You have a specific color that you have to wear. You have specific food that you have to make. This is Eid. When you become Muslim, it's not about Bengali culture anymore. What is your Islamic culture? That's what you do. And likewise, there are stuff like this in African culture. Stuff like this in Arabian culture and things like that. In the American culture, when our brothers and sisters, they leave the Christianity or Judaism or atheism or whatever they were upon and they become Muslim. Alhamdulillah, they know they have to leave these uh, shirk-based cultures behind. Whatever Islam approves, I keep. Whatever contradicts Islam, I get rid of. Because we said, La ilaha illallah. I am a Muslim first. African second, Bengali second, Pakistani second, American second. We are Muslims first. That's the beauty of Islam. Regardless of your color, regardless of your mother tongue, regardless of what part of the world you are from, certain attributes are exactly the same. That's the unity of Islam. The banner of La ilaha illallah. Whatever is shirk according to the American Muslim must be shirk according to the Pakistani Muslim. Whatever is a bid'ah according to the African Muslim is going to be bid'ah according to the Chechen Muslim. That's how it's supposed to be. Anything from your different cultures that Allah has given from His beauty, from His perfectness, that Islam is quiet about, we keep it. No problem. No problem. But anything where clearly the texts of Islam have spoken, we stay away from those days, we stay away from those uh, cultural uh, attributes, those custom, the festivities, right? This is the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is from the perfection of Tawheed. As, uh, and we'll conclude as Imam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said, that the Muslims should not do any of the rituals of the kuffar, of the mushrikun, at the time of their festivities. Rather, the day of festival should be like any other day for the Muslims. So February 14th, it's a day of, uh, you know, it's Valentine's Day. What should I do? What should I do? What should I do? What were you doing on the 13th of February and what are you going to do on the 15th of February? Just take it as a day, another day. You don't have to go crazy thinking, oh my God, oh my God, what should I do? What should I do? It's just like any other day for you as a Muslim. It's not your day of Eid. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it, right? So this is how you are supposed to, inshallah ta'ala, uh, approach these type of days and festivities. All right, so let's go to uh, the uh, questions. Charlemagne, the Char Charles the Great. Yes, that's the, that's the Charles I was talking about. Uh, what are the questions? Let me refresh. If a co-worker or friend of yours gave you a gift because it was their holiday, should you, kindly, should you be kindly accepting it or tell them you cannot accept this uh, because the gift is associated with the non-Muslim holidays? A actually, that is uh, a good opportunity for you to do some da'wah work, 
Like let's suppose, for example, uh, on, on Christmas, somebody gives you a gift and says, Merry Christmas, right? You can use that as a day of da'wah, as an opportunity that, you know, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that you uh, thought of me on your special day, uh, but we, we have our special days. How about, you, uh, you know, you, you can give me a gift on my day and, you can, and this will lead to a conversation. And I'll give you a gift on my day as well. On our days of Eid, if you want to give a gift to a non-Muslim, there's nothing wrong with it, right? This opens the door to conversations. What you should not do is give gifts on their holidays, right? Because these are days of shirk. We don't celebrate this. So on your days of Eid, make some food, make some sweets for your neighbors, give them out. You know, these are, these are the opportunities for you to um, do da'wah work, right? On, on a Friday, hey, this is our best day of the week. You guys have Sunday or the Jew has Saturday. We have Friday. Let's, let's, then they might ask you, like, what's, what's so special about Friday? And you start talking about Islam. So you bring the conversation back in this way without being rude or be like, oh, get out of here. You, you are a polytheist. I don't want your gift. That's not the way to do da'wah. You would say, thank them. Okay, thank you very much for having kind thoughts of me. But the thing is, you know, I, I can't accept this. Uh, you know, this is not my religious festivity. They'll actually be, oh, I'm so sorry to offend you. I didn't know. Subhanallah, most Westerners will actually react that way. Most of them. Some of the bigots will make cuss you out, but that's some. It is, I mean, we live in some strange times. If a Muslim invites you to a birthday and you tell your Muslim brother or sister, that I don't celebrate birthdays, I don't want to come. You extremist, you are Taliban, you this, you that. That's what the Muslim will do to you. But when you tell a non-Muslim, you know, I don't celebrate this day, I have uh, other sets of days, they'll actually, a lot of them might say, oh, I'm so sorry to offend you, I didn't know. I mean, subhanAllah, like what world do we live in? A Muslim feels offended if you practice Islam. Right, so these are, of course, we have to have sabr. These are the trials of the dunya. We just have to deal with it uh, with, the, with the best of our ability, inshallah ta'ala. If someone is already married or engaged, is it okay to celebrate Valentine's Day with the spouse? Uh, so as I addressed it in the lecture, but if it wasn't clear, let me repeat. No, this is not a day that you, just because you're married, you think, well, she's not my girlfriend and I'm not her boyfriend. She's my wife and I'm her husband. I should go celebrate this day. No, you have so many days of the year to take your wife to a dinner. Why do you not take your wife out on Friday? It's a day of your Eid, right? It's a day of your weekly, it's, it's your weekly Eid. Why don't you do something with your kids and your wife? Go out somewhere, eat at uh, a restaurant, go out somewhere, do something on Friday afternoon. SubhanAllah, uh, let me... I remember Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, rahimahullah, uh, after he died, his wife is the one who gave this in the interview. I mean, this is how we know, because his wife told, uh, told the people in an interview, and that's how it got recorded. On, on Yawmul Jumu'ah, Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, and who, I mean, this is Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, one of the biggest scholars of Islam of this generation, the top three, one of the top three scholars of this generation, a busy man. People calling him all over the world, from all over the world for fatawa, for this, for lectures, for that. On Friday afternoons, after Juma, khutbah and all this, he will not answer people's phones, he will not take any fatwa questions, nothing. He will spend that day with his wife and children. It's a day of Eid. And he did this on a regular basis. These are the ulama of sunnah. They understand the days. So this is what happens to Muslim families. We are all imprisoned by this dunya. You, you, don't, you are unable to teach your children your Islamic days. You're forced to have a day off on Sunday or Saturday, a day for the Jews and the day for the Christians, and your children miss Friday. Of course, you don't keep the whole day off. That's not from our religion. You work on a Friday. You take a pause for Salat al-Jum'ah. And then in the afternoon, once your work is done, you have Friday the rest of the afternoon, do something. Do something with your family, right? This is uh, what you're supposed to do. These are from the 
adab from the manners of Islam to teach your family the beauty of Islam. And if you do this on a regular basis, almost on a weekly basis, it may not be possible every single week, but as much as you can, your kids are not going to come to you on their birthday once a year or Valentine's Day or this or that. We're, we're celebrating, we're doing something special every week, kids, every week, my dear wife, right? It's, it's easy to satisfy one another, inshallah ta'ala. Right, so remember these things. That don't celebrate the Valentine's Day just because you're married. You have so many other days. Why just uh, February 14th? You've got to do something special. So stay away uh, from uh, doing it on this day. Let's see. Is it okay to eat Valentine's candy if it is cheaper on sale? It's the same thing that you find the candies and the whole heart-shaped candies and this and that, these are specific to that festivities. They do not sell this candy in November or July or December. It is specifically for this time. So those type of things you stay away from. Don't be tempted by the shaitan that, okay, the candies are cheap, it's the, the, it's the, these are the candies for Valentine and this and that. Buy your candies some other time. Don't worry about it. Right? If your niyyah is inshallah ta'ala to avoid shirk, Allah will put the barakah in your wealth. Don't worry about saving a few dollars, buying something which is specifically made for this shirk festival. Stay away from it. Look at Ibrahim alayhi salam, the best example. He was still weak. He's the only Muslim. And the people of Babylon, they have their shirk festivals. What did he say? I'm sick, I can't go out with you guys tonight. He didn't know what to do. He still, he was powerless against all these mushrikun. He still made up a lie just to save himself from that day of shirk. He did not want to be sitting in a gathering of shirk, of, of festivities. He's a man of tawheed. He said, I'm feeling sick, I can't come out with you guys and do all this tonight. That's it. Make whatever excuse you need to avoid shirk. That's what the point is, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, let's see. I see some other questions. I'm not sure if this is accurate, but is a reason why birthday celebration is not allowed in Islam is because it can be same as the birthday person is being praised and it is an entire day of him and friends and family may act very humble to the person. Uh, no, that's not correct. Actually, birthdays also go back the origin of celebrating birthdays also go back to the Roman Greek uh, religions. Uh, so I, I obviously I didn't get into that, but that's why I said like today's, tonight's lecture, it is applicable to all these other days that you see the European cultures would be celebrating. They all go back to Roman Greek paganism, even the concept of celebrating birthdays. Can you do anything special for your marriage anniversary? Uh, buy flowers for the wife or some clothes or take out to dinner. So that, it's the same thing. The anniversaries, if, if it was something good, right, we go back and ask the same question. That if this was something good, or actually let's ask this question. Is there any Muslim man alive today who can love their wife more than the way Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved his wives? No, we can't. There is no way on earth we can be the husband that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was. We try our best to imitate him as husbands and fathers, but we will never fulfill it. We have to try. That's the jihad that we have to do. But he is the number one husband and father known to the Muslims, to all believers. Did he ever do anything like this for his wife? No, he didn't. So as a Muslim, we have to understand that who are we supposed to imitate? Whose footsteps are we supposed to follow? A kafir today tells you, you, if you love your wife, make sure you say happy anniversary, take her to the expensive restaurant, have a lobster and steak dinner and this and that. Why can't I have a, why can't I have a lobster and steak dinner on some other day? On my day of Eid? on uh, Eid al-Adha or Eid al-Fitr. Of course, Eid al-Adha, you might be slaughtering a cow. Make steaks out of it, no problem. 
right? Have steak at that time. Or a dinner for Eid al-Fitr. Or Friday is a day of Eid, a uh, weekly basis. Let's go eat dinner. Have that steak and lobster dinner on Friday, right? So these are the things that you have to remember. That go back and think. That listen, I, my job as a Muslim man, I, to be a good husband, I need to be the husband that Muhammad sallallahu was. You as a Muslim woman, you want to be a good wife? Be the wife that Khadija was, that uh, Aisha was, that Zainab was, that Maimuna was, that Safiya was, that Juwairiya was. Imitate them. You have so many examples. I have one example, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and that, of course that's more than enough. But as a woman, you have so many wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to imitate. Right? Whoever you think your personality matches. Imitate that wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So this is how we as Muslims need to behave. We have to approach life and our religion this way. That every group of people has a sharia and a manhaj, has a methodology. This is what Allah told us. Remember the two verses I said in the beginning? That remember those two verses. Allah has obligated upon every group of people. You have a specific sharia and you have a specific methodology. You have specific laws and you have specific methodologies in how you're supposed to practice and live life. So that's what we uh, go back. Uh, and, and, and address ourselves with inshallah ta'ala. And again, if you are following the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa every now and then, even when your wife least expects it, you just bring, bring a gift for her. Because that's the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa She's not expecting it, it's a surprise. If you do this consistently, which is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to do, all year round, I, I can promise you she will not care about the anniversary day. Because all year round, she already feels that love for you, from you. One day is not going to make a difference. And the same thing, it's not just, uh, you know, I, I don't want to just beat down on the brothers. The sisters got to do the same thing. Show that love and the respect and the honor of your husband all year round. He's not going to care about, hey, you didn't make that special Michelin star uh, dinner for me. Today, tonight's our anniversary. He won't care, right? So it's about consistency, inshallah ta'ala, with each other. Uh, if any one Muslim brother asks to use our membership to buy the gifts to get discount for Christmas Day, so how should we say no to him since he never told us that he will use for Christmas gift like just the one day before the Christmas? Okay, so, uh, so the brother is asking about what if you have, let's say you have Sam's Club membership. You have the Sam's Club membership, but your Muslim brother, he doesn't. And, be, and during these seasons, these times, of course, uh, they put sales on their products, Christmas time and things like that, because they want to sell more products, right? In some countries, I don't want to mention the names, they jack up the prices during Eid. <laughs> they, they start cheating people more because they know they'll get more customers. SubhanAllah. Right? May Allah guide our ummah right? away from greed. So here... They know that they're going to sell more products. So let's lower the price. We'll sell more goods and eventually we'll make more profit. This is simple business. Simple business. Uh, business philosophy. So anyway, so they put sales on a lot of their products. Now what if your Muslim brother wants to use your Sam's Club membership for that discount because he doesn't have that membership. He just wants to be able to go because some of these stores, they won't let you even shop if you don't have their card. So I'm just going to go there once or twice. Why do I want to pay for the whole 40, 50, whatever dollars it is for the whole year? Uh, and they allow you to have a second card, third card anyways. So if you and your friend are really close to each other, you can have that second card or third card if it's mutually agreed upon, inshallah. So no problem with that. But the issue is, if he doesn't tell you that he wants to buy these Christmas gifts, that's not your uh, fault. Indeed, the deeds are judged based on intentions. He came and asked you, can I use it? Your intention is you want to help a fellow Muslim out. You don't know what his intention is. That's not between you, uh, you know, that's not your problem. You would expect that inshallah, hey, don't cheat me, don't do anything haram and so on and so forth. If you find out that this brother has betrayed your trust, he has done something haram with your name with your card. Then you say to the brother, you know what, 
I don't want to help you in this regard next time because I'm really deeply hurt. You shouldn't have done this. Right? This is how you would go about it. But if you did not know, th there is no fault upon you. Rather, the fault will be on that person who has deceived you, who has hidden or kept this information from you. All right, uh, let's see. Can we decorate our house with lightings on Eid, like Christmas? Uh, yes and no. So if you want to decorate your house with lights, and of course, inshallah ta'ala, Ramadan is coming, Eid al-Fitr is coming, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us alive so that we can uh, worship Him uh, properly in this month of Ramadan. It's very close, 50 odd days, I believe, uh, inshallah ta'ala. You want to decorate your house for Eid, for Ramadan, see your children, uh, you know, uh, enjoy this month of Ramadan, the day of Eid, this is completely fine, right? No problem. Like Christmas, this is wrong. What does like Christmas mean? Don't put the reindeer and the Christmas tree and the snowman and Santa on a sledge, uh, right? Uh, in front of your house, right? So that part of the decorations stay away from. So it's not fully like Christmas, but let's say put some lights and things like, you just want to decorate your house for the day of Eid. No problem. There's nothing in the Sharia saying that that is not allowed. You just avoid the specific items that are used by the kuffar in their celebrations. Like, for example, the snowman, the reindeer, the elves, the big fat Santa, and so on and so forth, right? So specific, things that are specific to the religions, stay away from those items, but you decorate your house in other ways. All right, so the brother uh, asked a further question. So he wants to buy a perfume because it's on sale. All right, perfume is different, right? Now you're giving a specific uh, example so I can give you a specific answer. Let's suppose what would be, okay, Christmas Day, they, usually the Americans for Christmas dinner, they cook a turkey. So in and around Christmas time, turkeys are usually cheaper than other times, and especially Thanksgiving time, turkeys are much cheaper. So Christmas is also, the, um, the usual American dinner is cooking ham, which alhamdulillah we don't eat anyway, it's pig, right? But turkey, which we do eat. Now would you go and buy a turkey on that Christmas day or the day before Christmas, that this is the food that they're cooking just for that special dinner? Wait, don't worry about it, uh, you know, you're, you're, inshallah you'll still live if you don't have turkey for that day, even though you're not celebrating Christmas. Just stay away from that. Uh, buy the actual dish later on. There's nothing wrong with eating turkey, but it is that day's main dinner for the American culture, uh, that they cook the turkey and the ham for uh, Christmas dinner. Now perfumes, this is different. It's just on sale, right? Let's say you, your kids, they want to buy the Xbox or the PS5 or whatever the case is, or some games, inshallah ta'ala, not violent games, decent games like, uh, what's, what is it, uh, Minecraft or something like that, right? Not Grand Theft Auto, but uh, let's say these games are on sale uh, on, on Christmas time. All right, I'm going to go and save me some money. I'm not celebrating Christmas or this and this is the product or anything. Uh, jackets, clothing, shoes, everything is on sale. I'm just going there for my clothing. I have nothing to do with Christmas. You can take benefit of the sales. That's not an issue, right? It's not an issue. Here we're going to say again, Your deeds are based on your intentions. I have nothing to do with this day of shirk. I don't believe it. I don't celebrate it. I'm not buying anything that's specific to Christmas. Shoes, jackets, this, that. I need it anyway in my daily life. It's on sale. I'm going to go save me some money. This is different from the candy that the brother asked about for Valentine's Day. That these are specific candies, specific shapes that they only sell during Valentine's season. They don't do this at other times. So that specific candy you stay away from, right? So anything that is specific to the festival, you stay away from it. But something general that there is a sale going on, no problem. I'll go, you know, save me some money, inshallah ta'ala, no problem. So this is the balance in an understanding and practice. So hopefully uh, this is clear. Uh, 
let's see. I'll take uh, one more question. Let's see. I don't see any other question. Okay, so this is uh, Brother Thakid, and we'll take this as the last question. So what if you buy something that is holiday-related but only because uh, they sell it during that time, like peppermint latte or pumpkin spice stuff? The drinks, I, these are the drinks, right, from uh, Star Sucks and uh, Dunkin' Donuts, right? <laughs> so... <clears throat> They sell that, uh, you know, the pumpkin spice or peppermint latte, they don't just keep it for a couple of days or a week, right? It's like seasonal stuff. In the winter time, they'll keep the pumpkin spice, like even Wawa has the pumpkin spice uh, coffee. They'll keep it for the whole month of October, November. They, I think they start selling it from September, right, and into December. So it's the whole winter season they have that uh, flavor. And same thing with the peppermint latte. Uh, I'm not really fond of the la peppermint latte, but the pumpkin spice coffee, yes. Uh, truth be told, I, I have <laughs> drank, drunk that from Wawa. But uh, this, this is, again, it's a winter thing, the pumpkins and these things. Uh, it, th this would be really cornering yourself a lot, right? Just don't, I'm not gonna buy a pumpkin just for the sake of Halloween or things like that, but pumpkin is a vegetable you can eat throughout the year, any other day. You don't have to specifically go on that time. But the point is that this uh, pumpkin spice topping or the flavor, it has nothing to do with the celebration. It's not that this is something that they do related to Halloween or whatever it is. It's just a flavor that they bring out uh, in wintertime. Sometimes they bring it out even in springtime and other times. So they Oh, the pumpkin spice is back and this and that. So even they themselves don't keep it just for that time. They introduce it. They want to sell it, build up the hype, right? This is a whole uh, business tactic. They build up the hype for this, uh, this flavor for that time. Then they bring it again and this and that. So it's not really directly uh, related to the Halloween. But again, if... Uh, Anybody wants to correct me, inshallah ta'ala, definitely I'll also stop drinking the pumpkin spice coffee. I don't have a problem. But from my research, I don't think I have found anything that it is directly related to that. But again, if anybody else knows anything that I don't know, please make sure you reach out to me and let me know because I also want to stop drinking it. No problem, inshallah ta'ala. Right? So that would be the answer. So my conclusion for this is Allah knows best. All right, so that would be any other question that I'm missing. All right, so that was the last one, inshallah. So we'll see each other again on Saturday. All right, subhanakum hamdik, ashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, astaghfiruk wa atubu ilaik, wa assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.